Naturally, it didn't work. Nothing ever worked on the first try. All the LEDs were backwards. Building something new is really hard. But do I regret it? Hi there, my name's Adam and welcome to Local Bites. Now, today I want to talk about the local deck. Not everything has gone perfectly and, I mean, not everything has gone wrong. But building products is hard. Like, really hard. Finding information about how to go through this process, it's near impossible now. Fortunately, with modern day on YouTube, this, this is slowly changing and there's more and more people talking about this process. But ultimately, I like to try to be the solution I want to see. So recently, after about nine months of development, we released the local deck into the world. Not all of that time was spent on the local deck. We've got quite a lot of stuff happening here at Local Bytes. But from the first designs through to public release was about nine months. And due to a series of issues, ultimately it took us about three months to ship our first units. So yeah, in this video, I'd like to demystify the process and highlight some of the things that went well and some of the things that didn't. But let's rewind a bit. Let's go back to the summer of 2023. Now the thing is to start off designing a product, you need to figure out what to design. Nowadays, new products are really difficult to think of. You know, most innovations are just variations of an existing concept. Take dating apps for an example. It's essentially just texting for strangers. And Slack, it's just a group chat for the office. Uh, yes, I'm oversimplifying, but you can see where I'm going with this. Now, the local deck drew from various sources of, of information. I've been doing smart home for quite a while now and I've seen a bunch of different ways to control your house. Nowadays I see a lot of people using Zigbee based buttons, we sell a few of them on the shop, and there's some Zigbee buttons that have multiple buttons on them. You know, some of the stuff from Ikea in their Throd3 range, they have Zigbee buttons that have four independently um, actuated buttons and you can bring that information into Home Assistant and control, you know, four different things or four different actions, whatever. And um, another source of information was actually Taron, formerly from Linus Tech Tips. Uh, he uses a lot of keyboards um, to make his workflow more efficient. Having all of your controls laid out like this as a single layer of dedicated keys with everything clearly labeled means that you can work more quickly and more accurately. It just requires more physical space. And of course there is the Stream Deck. It's a 16 button keypad that has LCDs that connects to your computer so you can control your stream. It was designed for, for streaming. This so I drew a lot of inspiration from those different things and ultimately I came up with what I wanted and that was a keypad that could control your smartphones. Um, we've got to turn that into a list of requirements. For example, we wanted RGB, who doesn't love RGB, a healthy amount of buttons, especially for a Wi-Fi based product. I definitely believe there needs to be a lot of functionality that we can offer. Otherwise, why aren't we using Zigbee? And an open source software stack. Now that was doable through ESP Home, but we'll get onto that a little bit later. On to step two, the initial designs. Now, usually when you're designing product, people will say you start from the outside and you work your way in. So the outside could be the look and feel of the product. And then we've got to have a look at what it's going to do, and then we work on the implementation detail on how it achieves that. We threw that all away with local deck. We did it the complete opposite way around. I started designing the PCB before designing the enclosure. Now, part of the reason behind this was the logistics of the first few weeks. Um, notably, I was on a summer holiday. Additionally, designing a PCB was kind of easy to pick up I already had a little bit of experience, so I could at least pull together some schematics and turn that into an initial revision. Naturally, it didn't work. Nothing ever worked on the first try, but you've got to do the first one to do the second one. 
And you got to do the second to do the third, and eventually you'll get there. The general circuitry was there. We had a matrix keypad. That was fine. We had a string of LEDs. Um, I forgot a bunch of strapping pins for the ESP32. Um, but a revision later, we had a working deck. Uh, it would boot. It would flash. I could start writing some software for it. Sure, some of it didn't work properly. Um, we only had one USB port, for instance, at that time. Later, we added the real one as well. So the first sort of five prototype PCBs, I had to solder on little jumpers to to make the board work properly. It did take a, a bit of time, a few revisions. The, the enclosure was a little harder. It took a while, but I had a few friends. I had a friend in um, engineering and another in product design. So uh, I... Got them together, bought them some some food in uh, in return for for some advice, and ultimately I found a design that would work for both three D printing, be that FDM or SLA, or injection molding. So that is the physical product itself. Next up, we've got to move on to the software. Now, as a company, we've been a fan of Tasmota for quite a while. Ultimately, our first product, the local white smart plug, existed just as a Tasmota product, it took us about two and a half years before we added another variant with the SP Home. That said, the local deck is different. Tasmota, I've found, is fantastic for devices that I buy, but it's not as good for devices that I build. Tasmota is very general. You can install it, and then you can configure it. ESP Home, on the other hand, you configure it and then you install it. As such, I find myself reaching for ESP Home the moment I want a more bespoke solution. So ultimately, we settled on the idea of creating our own configurator UI. Now, originally, the configurator was just a web-based tool. It was baked into the blog and you could configure your local deck, hit download, and it will give you a YAML file. But ultimately, after some feedback from a crack commando unit sent to a military prison for crimes they didn't commit, the insiders. We went down the route of a add-on for Home Assistant. This would allow you to go back to your configuration, make changes, save it. It was a lot smoother. So that's the software side of things, and we've designed the product. That's it, right? We just launch it into the world. You know, fortunately, we're using techniques that cater to low volume production. Our case, for instance, is designed to work with 3D printing, and PCB manufacturers are a dime a dozen nowadays. But ultimately, the design had gone through a few revisions, so I wanted to get a final version of everything uh, just to make sure it all fit. Additionally, it meant we had something we could take to events like open source, and that was fantastic. So we got that sorted. We filmed the release video, and we were ready to launch. This brought us around April 1st. Now, the plan was to have a two-month launch window. Most of the stock we were using has a bad amount more than three times, so this seemed logical to us. So one month after launch, we go and order everything, and this is where we started running into problems immediately. The PCBs, for instance. If you want 10 assembled PCBs, fine, you can do that. You can check out, and within a week, you've got a product. If you want to order 250, it's a little more difficult. Now, the supply we're using doesn't allow you to place a pre-order for PCBs. You can only place an order if you've got all of the components in stock. Now, when we went to order, they could run out of USB ports. Great. So we pre-ordered those components, and that took about a week, week and a half to, to come in, and then we could order the PCBs, right? Right? <laughs> no. They had run out of hot swap sockets, uh, LEDs, uh, and I think diodes they were short falling on. So we did what we should have done in the first place, uh, put the order in for our entire bill of materials so that we could just place the order. And, and this ultimately delayed production by about three weeks. And I wish that's where the story ended. But it's never that simple, is it? We eventually got that stock through when, well, that's when step 4B happened. It's human error. Now, mistakes happen. It's, it's a part of life. And uh, with local deck, there was a mistake and I did a patch instead of a fix. 
Now, I don't really believe in human error when it comes to processes. That's not to say that humans don't make error. We absolutely do. But people are not infallible. We're not automatons. We're calculating machines. But you know what is a calculating machine? A machine that calculates or computes a computer. What do I mean by this? Well, if you want to remove the possibility of human error, you need to remove the human. This doesn't work for things like design, and well, that's why we have DRC, you know, design rule checks. Now, there were a few discrepancies between the parts library we used and the parts library that our supplier used, and we can just fix this when uploading it, right? So an offset of 180 degrees increased our assembly time from, you know, about a minute, 30 seconds per unit to about five to 10 minutes. All the LEDs were backwards. Now, when I discovered this error in the samples, because I successfully fixed it for the samples, should have done more research. I should have found the actual fix. Instead, I patched it. I clicked rotate twice, you know, when I uploaded it to our supplier. I didn't do this correctly for the production run. Ultimately, the more you can remove the human from a process, well, the less a human error can happen because there is no human. And that moves us on to step five, where we are right now, where we go from here and how we make everything right. Now the local deck is still maturing. We're still, you know, finding the occasional software issue. There's still a few things we are looking to fix upstream with ESP Home. We're working on making everything a little more resilient and, you know, there's changes going into the next revision of PCBs. We're rerouting things to lower the amount of interference. Um, we're adding more debugging pins so that we can flash it without having to plug a USB cable in and pull it back out again. At the moment, I don't have an answer for all of that, where we're going and what we do next. Our current focus is still finishing the production run. We're almost there. There's 240 units in this run. We've done 180, so we've got about 60 left. And once we've done that, we'll be turning off the pre-orders so that you know, when you order, you know you're going to receive it within our standard uh, shipping policy. And yeah, hopefully over the next few months, we'll be able to make sure that the local deck can be deployed with confidence. Because at the end of the day, our home automation system doesn't always exist within the home of the person setting it up. I've been in situations where we've looked at deploying Home Assistant to help with elderly relatives. And, you know, something like the local deck could really work for them. But that's pointless if it's a fragile tool. Now, ultimately, I need to wrap up this video. It's not a live stream at the end of the day. And I hate ending a long chain of thought with to summarize, but here I am doing exactly that. Building something new is really hard. But do I regret it? Yes. No, it's been a brilliant learning process. Ultimately, by trade, I'm a software guy. I write web things for the internet. And yet here I am having released a physical product that honestly I'm really proud of. And two years ago, I didn't see that happening. So do I regret it? No, not at all. Ultimately, if there's something you want to see in the world and you have the ability to do it, then do it, make it. And that's not to say you have to start a company and release a product, but there's so many things that, so many products that started off as a project and projects that started off as, you know, just a hobby. Looking at you 3D printing. So get something out there and build something. It will go wrong. The first time you do anything, it is going to suck. And the local deck is no exception to that. The first unit didn't even work. But without doing something once, you can't do it another time. You can't start to build on that knowledge. You can't improve. The sooner you make something that sucks, the sooner you can start improving on it and developing not only your product, but developing yourself. And I think that is something that money can't really buy. So I hope this has been helpful. If there's anything that you think we should cover in more detail, then please feel free to drop us a comment and 
head on over to the forum. If watching this video has helped you, then I'm really pleased to hear it. Please consider dropping a like and a subscribe and all of the other YouTube stuff, I don't know. And of course, you could have been doing anything today, but you're, you're here. You're listening to me jammer on about the past year of my life. And no, for that, I thank you. I think that's all for now. But we'll be back, as always, next month with some more information, more nuggets of goodness for you. So until next time, I've been Adam. This has been Local Bites. Thank you. Bye for now.